Good morning. Welcome on this Mother's Day, also Good Shepherd Sunday, as we recall with joy the blessings God gives us through Jesus, our Good Shepherd, and also those who serve us in His place, including, again, our mothers. Good just, just doesn't seem to cut it anymore. Advertisers and promoters want to use stronger adjectives. They think that's what it takes to get our attention. In order to sell more products, they must be new and improved. Great! Far superior. Recommended by more doctors. And in order to attract crowds to a big event, they are promoted as colossal extravaganza. The biggest ever. Never repeated. We've been seeing this happening with garage sales. You know, it used to be just garage sale. Now it's a huge garage sale. Multi-family garage sale. Or as one sign in Sock Rapids said Friday, jaw-dropping garage sale. I didn't get there. If Madison Avenue and promoters have exercised the same influence over the church in the past, maybe the Friday before Easter would be known as colossal extravaganza, super special, never before attempted, fantastic Friday. I don't know about you, but I think I'll stick with good Friday. Those extra words, those flowery terms, add nothing. In fact, I think they detract from the simple truth and the powerful events of Good Friday. I mean, if a product or an activity or an event is really good, are those extra words necessary? If a batter lines a clean single, maybe knocks in a couple of runs in the second inning, you might say good hit, but it's probably not going to go, you know, in, in the all-time record books. If someone serves you a tasty meal, maybe it isn't, you know, a gourmet seven-course meal, but a, a tasty meal, a simple, mmm, good, will suffice. People like to have a good job. You might wonder about somebody that says they have a great and fantastic job. The student wants to get good grades might think they're bragging if they'd say much more. No flowery words and flattery do not improve the quality of a product or our appreciation of it, especially if it's not true, if they're covering up flaws. If there's something that's really good, everybody knows about it. And so it is with Jesus. Jesus was not one to go around needlessly flattering himself. Unlike Muhammad Ali, we don't see Jesus saying, I am the greatest. He added nothing that was untrue, that was not helpful to people understanding his message. He simply calls himself, in John's 10th chapter, the Good Shepherd. But with all the hype around us today, maybe we need to consider, is good good enough? is good enough as his sheep are satisfied with the description of who he is and what he does. In the entrance psalm, David wrote, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall lack nothing. The sheep who know him are satisfied with that. However, we hear in our text that the Jews, a term John and even Paul used in our readings to describe those who were hostile to Jesus, did not know him, and so they demanded that he answer directly, Are you the Christ? Jesus' reply is, I did tell you, on many occasions I made it clear who I am, that I am the Son of the Father, the Mighty One. But that was met with doubt and questions. And then Jesus brings up the miracles that he did in his Father's name, which certainly should have made him recognizable, for those were the things prophesied of the Christ in the Old Testament, which was read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. But Jesus' words and works that he had done were not accepted. 
Those folks did not believe. All they did was get more and more upset, more and more resistant, ready to charge him with blasphemy for claiming equality with God. They weren't satisfied with what he had done. They wanted him to clearly confirm what he said or give them such an amazing, spectacular super sign that nobody could help but believe. In contrast, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice. This is a very effective hearing and believing in the life-giving, powerful voice of the shepherd of the sheep. Sheep believe in their shepherd without spectacular signs and wonders, which is only the result of real spirit-worked faith to believe in Jesus in the state of humiliation, that humiliation that culminated at the cross. I mentioned to the release time students a few weeks ago, it takes real faith to believe in a God, in a Savior, who was beaten and crucified, who humbled himself. Yet Jesus did humble himself. He came as the Son of Man. He used a simple title like Good Shepherd to help us know and understand him. He didn't flaunt his power. That faith also shows us the tremendous power of God's love, which can lead and turn sinners away from love of self and love of the world to love of their Savior. The message that does this is called simply the good news, the gospel. It needs no human height or embellishment. And though I won't take issue with Fulton Orsler, who called his story of the life of Jesus the greatest story ever told, I'll give him that. But Jesus points out that he is, very simply and clearly, the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. That is the message the sheep need to keep on hearing, taking to heart. And it's the message that we are privileged to make known to those around us, simply and clearly, again, not without a lot of hype or embellishment. That is the message Jesus commissioned his followers. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I have commanded you. They took that gospel message out into the world, as did Paul after his conversion, as he mentioned in the first lesson. And they turned the world upside down. Yes, sheep are satisfied as their deepest needs are met. Jesus, the Good Shepherd, provides the foundation, but he delegates the task of providing this care and taking out this message to those, his under-shepherds. Now, when you hear of the under-shepherds, you might think of those referred to in our first lesson, the overseers of the flock. And indeed, the word pastor comes from the Latin for shepherds. But there are many others who shepherd us in our life, who serve in God's place to provide spiritual as well as even physical care to those under their care, to the sheep. We certainly would include pastors, or not parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles. We would include teachers in church and in school. We would include even our civic leaders, who are, in a sense, shepherds. Of course, today, we think of those who have shepherded us in a very personal and powerful way. We think of those who, in God's place, gave us life and nurtured and cared for that life. We think of the blessings God has given us through our mothers. As we think back, I, you know, and you can look at your own life, and I suppose you could wonder, well, let's see, am I, was I a credit? Did my mother do a good job? Or if she would have not have done such a good job, I'd be in an even worse shape. It's hard to say. But we can look back and be thankful for the blessings God gives through our mothers. Recognizing that and being thankful especially for those who pointed us to the Good Shepherd, who gave us and taught us about Jesus who set us on that path to eternal life. Of course, they set us on that path that they, too, needed to follow. 
We did not excuse mothers from making confession of sins this morning because they, like all of us, have their shortcomings. There may have been times when uh, even a good mother put her needs or her desires ahead of others, where she may have faltered and failed in her parental skills. Still, many blessings are received from our mothers, and what they lack and what we all lack to enter eternal life is available to us as we follow Jesus, who is our Good Shepherd, and as the psalm reminds us, I, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall lack nothing. I lack nothing I need to be part of his flock, now and for all eternity. Yes, we are privileged to know Jesus as our Good Shepherd. He gives us eternal life. Jesus said, no one can come to the Father but by me, and no one can come to me unless given him by my Father. And so that is the source of our eternal life. And this is the encouragement we have in this eternal life, which actually is ours right now. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is a great source of comfort as we face trials and challenges and adversity in this life. We know that we, through the Good Shepherd, are among those who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, who stand before the Lord in everlasting innocence and righteousness and blessedness. This eternal life that we have, we know will continue. How can we know? Are you still hearing the Good Shepherd's voice? Do you follow the Good Shepherd where he leads? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior? Then eternal life is yours, now and forever. No one can snatch you out of his hand. What a comfort it is that during his time on earth, Jesus spoke of himself, sometimes in some vague things, but very often, in clear, simple, unpretentious terms, things that people were familiar with and understood that helped us to understand his mission and his nature. Terms like good shepherd. We still know him in this way and describe him in this way and take comfort in his pure goodness. How often have you, at a time of loss, at a funeral, heard that 23rd psalm, the good shepherd psalm? Yes, to trust in someone who is really good is really a source of great comfort and joy in the midst of this world where there is so much deception and duplicity. And so, is good really a good <coughs> word we have to describe our Savior and the blessings he gives? Well, Jesus is indescribably good. We see that he is one with the Father, sharing the same divine essence. He is fully and truly God. He is equal to the Father in power. He said, no one can snatch my sheep out of my hand, and no one can snatch my sheep out of my Father's hand. And we rejoice that the Good Shepherd shares the same divine love as our Heavenly Father. We remember the familiar verse, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But it was that same love that caused Jesus to stay in this world, to stay the course to the cross, and to remain there until his work of redeeming was finished. Because of his equality with the Father, the Son, Jesus, is also worthy of equal adoration, worship, and praise. In our second lesson, Multitudes stand before the throne of God and the Lamb, praising them for the salvation that he provides. Even the mighty angels fall before the throne and worship God and the Lamb at the center of that throne. That is our privilege, our inheritance, that yes, we too will stand among those multitudes, praising God for bringing us through the trials and tribulations of this life, 
and into his heavenly kingdom. The challenge of speaking of heaven, which we try to sing about in our last hymn, and which people have written about and talked about, is that it is so incredible, amazing, and different that our human words fail us in trying to adequately describe it. Notice how the praise of the angels runs on and on in our second reading. Say, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Those seven successive words of praise, one after the other, are given in that seven is the number of perfection and completeness. So it's an expression of the complete and perfect glory that God deserves and that he receives. And then, John goes on to describe the ten fulfillments. Now, you're familiar with ten, and when we say ten something, you probably think ten commandments, which are a blessing God has given to guide and direct us in how to be his faithful people, how to show his love to those around us, how to express our faith. But they are the law. Ten commandments are given to show us what to do and to warn us what will happen if we fail and fall short. Now, there are some folks, hopefully not too many, that think that the Ten Commandments are their key to entering heaven, to entering eternal life. If I can just keep those commandments, then I've got her made. Then, or I'm keeping them better than most other folks. So that's my hope of heaven. Well, in the Revelation to John, he doesn't speak of ten commandments, but he does speak of ten fulfillments. Ten fulfillments. They describe our blessed state in the presence of God and of the Lamb. Coming through the great tribulation, sorrow and trouble in the past. So the first three fulfillments describe our blessedness in the presence of God. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Wow. Be there present and under God's care and keeping. The next four fulfillments describe our freedom from the effects of sin. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. These are four freedoms from the oppression, the effects of sin, which, you know, here in Minnesota, surrounded by fields, rivers, and lakes, you know, the starving and the thirsting maybe don't bother us so much, and it's almost hard to remember the beating sun and the scorching heat, but they'll come. But these were real dangers, real afflictions, real threats to the people John was addressing. And then... For the people, John, then the last three fulfillments describe the source of this bliss. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Wow, that is a source of comfort. The Lamb who was slain has overcome death. His resurrection declared that. There will be, as John goes on to write later in the book of Revelation, no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Indeed, after trying to express in some humble way the glory and splendor of life with God in heaven, there really isn't too much more to say. So, I'll follow the example of Jesus. Say it very simply. Have a good day. And God continue to bless you with good days until he says to you, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds on Jesus, our good shepherd, the great shepherd of the sheep. Amen.